Monsters is a podcast about the worst human beings on the planet. The episodes of this podcast deal with murder, dismemberment, torture, rape, child abuse, and mental illness. Please turn back while you still can. Listener discretion advised. I want to take a moment to give an extra disclaimer on this episode. All of these stories in this season describe horrible acts against children, but this case provides graphic detail of a particularly disturbing death of an infant. Listener discretion is advised. On August 30th, 2017, four-month-old Sterling Cohen died due to neglect from his parents, Zachary Cohen and Cheyenne Harris. He had been left in a mechanical swing in the same diaper with no food or water for anywhere between 9 and 14 days. He had diaper rash so bad that it ate through his skin and caused E. coli from the feces to enter his bloodstream. Then, flies laid eggs in his diaper, causing maggots to crawl around in it for days before he died. This is Monsters. Come back and find out that he's deceased. Tapping me on the head, telling me I'm cheating, telling me I'm, you know, let me see your phone. Just kill her and she died. I think Diego Campione is totally in the wrong, and I hope he burns in hell for all his sins. Hell's not a very fun place. I only have two hands. I'm not four hands, girl. I'm two hands. And her lungs just get escalated and escalated. <laughs> I normally talk a little bit about filicide at the beginning of each episode, since that's the subject of this first season. This time, I'm not going to do that. There's no category that this case can be placed into. There's no study that can explain how two parents can allow their baby to die a slow and agonizing death like in this case. There's no way to explain how anyone could care so little about their own child. There's no hell hot enough for these people to burn in. Zachary Cohen had been raised in a Mennonite community by adoptive parents, but was kicked out at age 16 for smoking and drinking. He claimed to have started using methamphetamines when he was 17 years old. He started working long hours as a truck driver for a company that delivered liquid manure, which is also called slurry. He was introduced to methamphetamines as a method of staying awake. He was told, quote, it was better than no dose, end quote. Nodos is a popular high-caffeine pill that's taken by people, commonly truck drivers, who are trying to stay awake for long hours. At some point in his late teens or early 20s, Cohen married a woman named Sherry and had a son. The couple divorced at some point and the child began living with his parents, but there are no details as to why the boy didn't stay with either Cohen or his ex-wife. I'll go out on a limb here and say it's most likely due to drugs, but that is only speculation. Cohen began dating Cheyenne Harris somewhere around 2014. Cohen would have been around 25 years old at the time, and Harris around 17. After a year or so, Harris got pregnant and they had a daughter, Nala, who was born on November 15, 2015. From everything we know, Nala was healthy and didn't show any signs of physical neglect or abuse. They had been living in Louisiana, where Cohen had worked for a couple of different trucking companies, but in his testimony, he said that Harris wanted to move back to Iowa, so they eventually relocated to his hometown of Riceville. In the summer of 2016, Cheyenne became pregnant again. By this time, Harris had begun using meth, which was given to her by Cohen. He would claim during his testimony that she asked him for the drug, and she would become hard to deal with if she didn't get it. Sterling was born two weeks early in the bathtub of a friend's home. Zachary Cohen described the birth while testifying at his trial. The sound quality of that testimony is really bad, so I'm using the reading of the testimony from Harris's trial. Why don't you just tell us how Sterling was born? He was born in a bathtub. Where at? At my friend Rick's house. How is it that Sterling came to be born in the bathtub? Cheyenne thought she had constipation. And she sat and hollered for me to come to the bathroom, and she's like, he's coming. And so I immediately freaked out and closed the door and then stood outside the door for a little bit. And then I ran back in, and I helped her get in the bathtub to do a water birth. Had you had any training in giving birth at all? No. Now, you had two older children. Were you present when they were born? Yes. How did you know what to do? 
I had previously watched a water birth at one time in my life. At any time did you call 911? I did, after he was delivered and in her arms. When were you expecting Sterling? Two weeks later. Was he a little bit early? Yes. After Sterling was born on May 1st, 2017, in the bathtub, Cohen called 911 and the mother and baby were transported to the hospital. A test of the blood from the umbilical cord came back positive for methamphetamines, showing that Harris had been using while she was pregnant with him. There were questions about whether or not Cohen was the father of Sterling. He claimed in court that Sterling had lighter skin and that people would ask him if the boy was his. There was some question whether you were Sterling's father. Why would that even be a question? My other two children were darker complected like me, so I would get asked by other people, you know, because Sterling is, he was pretty fair complected and he had bright blue eyes, and they would just bring it up and ask, you know, be curious. What was your answer to this? I would tell them, honestly, I don't know, but even if he wasn't mine, I was going to still treat him as my own no matter what. The prosecutor pushed the theory that Cohen didn't care about the condition of Sterling because he didn't think he was the biological father. Cohen responded multiple times that that wasn't a factor in whether or not he cared for the baby. He also claimed that he never changed the baby's diaper. He said it was because he had a weak stomach, which Harris knew about, so she was supposed to be doing it. Did you ever change any of Sterling's diapers? I did not. Why not? I don't do well with diarrhea. I start to vomit, and I vomit, diarrhea, things like that. I physically can't. My stomach can't take it. I have a very, very weak stomach. Had you ever changed any of Nala's diapers? One wet one, but nothing with feces in it. Was Cheyenne aware of this? Well, let me ask you this. Did you and Cheyenne ever discuss the fact that you had trouble changing diapers? Yes. When did you discuss it? When she was pregnant with Nala. He changed one diaper between his two children? I mean, I'm not a huge fan of diarrhea, but the baby needs to be changed. Even if you have an agreement that your partner is going to change all of the diapers, you should still be checking to see if they need a change and then notifying them. How is it possible to even pick up your baby and not notice they have a dirty diaper? Here's your answer. During the last couple weeks of Sterling's life, or during the month of August, did you ever hold Sterling? No. Why not? Usually he was sleeping and other times I was not to disturb him as he was a colicky baby and they're just super hard to get to sleep. When you say you were not to disturb him, what do you mean by that? Like pick him up out of his swing. I could go in and look at him, but he was usually covered in blankets. You could see his little head peeking out. Now, on the weekends you were home some of the time, correct? You didn't work seven days a week. Yeah. Did you ever interact with Sterling? I'm talking during the month of August. Did you interact with Sterling at all on the weekends? Yeah, in the earlier parts. The last couple weeks of his life, did you interact with him on the weekends? No, because of the, when he was sleeping. There was one day that I went in and he was reaching up like this, and I put my fingers in his hands and he grabbed them. Why didn't you go in and play with Sterling over the weekend? I was usually asleep because of the, usually the double loads and the hours that I worked, and plus the substance abuse. I was usually pretty tired. During the last two weeks of Sterling's life, he never picked him up. He never held him, or hugged him, or even picked him up to play with him. He looked at him sitting in a mechanical swing in a back bedroom like he was a museum exhibit. A few weeks after Sterling was born, they moved to a very small Iowa town called Alta Vista. With a population of only about 250 people, the town doesn't even take up one square mile. Without so much as a traffic light, you might not even realize you passed through it. Cohen got a job as a truck driver with a company hauling chickens around the tri-state area. During his testimony, he said he worked between 70 and 80 hours a week during the third shift, which made him work from about 5 p.m. to about 4 a.m. He claims that he regularly smoked meth during this time to help him stay awake during his long hours. He said that this was what contributed to his lack of interaction with Sterling. Do you remember telling Agent Turbot that you had last fed Sterling about two weeks before he passed away? I do. Is that an accurate statement that you made? Yes. Why didn't you feed him during the last two weeks of his life or the last couple weeks of his life? Usually that was when we started changing up our work schedule, so he would be asleep when I would get home from work. 
At any time were you aware that he was not being fed adequately? No. I think you mentioned in your interview something about Sterling not bulking up. What did you mean by that? He wasn't, he wasn't getting chubby like Nala was. She was a real chubby baby, I mean. And Sterling, he just, he wasn't, he wasn't bulking up from that. And I heard that he was just stretching out, getting taller. Well, when you say that you heard he was just stretching out, where did you hear that from? From Cheyenne's mother. Did you ever talk with Cheyenne about the fact that Sterling wasn't bulking up? Yes. Did she express any concerns to you about that? No. Cohen met another truck driver, Jordan Clark who worked for another company, also hauling chickens, and the two became friends. They would hang out and talk while waiting for loads to be ready. He testified in both Cohen and Harris's trials. After you met the defendant in April of 2017, did you become friends with him? Yes. What did you like about him? Just kind of personality for the most part. And did you ever work for the same company? No. Did you often show up at the same farms to pick up chickens? Yes. How often, uh, starting in May or April of that year, would you see the defendant at those farms where you picked up the chickens? Uh, probably every day or four out of five days a week. And did you spend time with them every day that you work? Usually, yeah. We have some wait time. And would you talk? Yeah. And would that be from April until August? Yeah. During all those times that you saw the defendant, did he ever tell you that he had a baby? Not that I can recall. He didn't tell you that he had a baby son? No. Did you know he had a little girl? Yes. Did he talk about the little girl? Yes. How often we talk about a little girl? Uh, at least once a night or every time I see him. But never about the baby. Is that no? No. He explains that Cohen never talked about having a baby son. He talked about Nala, but Clark never even knew he had a son. He also describes doing drugs at the apartment. The previous audio clip was from his testimony during Cohen's trial. The following clips are from Harris's trial, which is much better quality. A lot of people testified in both trials, and their testimonies are pretty close to the same. Did you ever go to the apartment in Alta Vista where Cheyenne Harris lived with Mr. Cohn? Yes. When did you go there first? Uh, probably around July, August, uh, July I'd say. Of 2017? Yes. How many times total did you go to that apartment in Alta Vista where the defendant lived with her living boyfriend, Mr. Cohn? Two, maybe three times. When you went to that apartment, was it a two bedroom apartment? I believe so, yes. Did you ever go into the, uh, the bedroom that Cheyenne and Zach Cohn shared? Yes. Why'd you go in there? Uh, basically just to do drugs away from the little girl. Did you ever go in the other room, the other bedroom, I should say, in, the, in that apartment? No. When you went in that bedroom to use drugs away from the little girl, what drugs were you using? Meth. How were you ingesting it? Smoke. Who else in that apartment was using meth with you? Uh, everyone. Who, who is that? It would be Zachary and Cheyenne. So Miss Harris, the defendant, used meth? Yes. How did she ingest it? The smoke as well. Who brought the meth? Uh, usually it was there, otherwise um, I did once. And you said you were at that apartment two or three times? Yes. Did you use meth with Miss Harris, the defendant, at that apartment the three times you were there? Uh, no. How many times did you use meth with her at the apartment? Once for sure, possibly twice. I can't remember exactly. Was that the only drug that you observed Miss Harris using at the apartment? Yes. And is the only location in that apartment where you smoked the methamphetamine in the bedroom shared by the defendant and Mr. Cohen? Yes. Where was Nala when you were using the meth? Uh, usually she was running her, or playing out in the living room. Or... Just a few feet away? Yes. He says that they would sit around the apartment and BS. They would go into Cohen and Harris's bedroom and smoke meth, and all three of them did it. 
he described never seeing a baby, not seeing the other bedroom door open, and nobody ever mentioned a baby while he was there. When you were in that apartment, did you know there was a baby in that apartment? No. Did you ever see the door to that back bedroom open where the, where the not the parents' bedroom, but the other door? Not that I can recall. When you were at that apartment, did Miss Harris ever mention that there was a baby in that apartment? Not that I recall 100%. Did you ever see a baby in that apartment? No. Did you ever see anybody go in the back room and check on the baby? I can't say for certain, but not that I can recall. When you were at that apartment, what was Nala doing? Usually playing, running around. Did you see the defendant, Miss Harris, interact and engage with Nala? Yes. Describe what you saw. Happy. Who is happy? Uh, Cheyenne and Nala. Did Cheyenne play with Nala? Yes. Did you provide any care for Nala? Yes. What did you see? I've seen get food ready for her and essentially take care of her. Did Nala appear healthy? Yes. Did she appear happy? Yes. Did she appear to be well nourished? Yes. And you said you saw Cheyenne actually prepare food and give it to Nala? Yes. Did Nala appear to be well nourished? Yes. Was she clean? Yeah. Properly clothed? Yes. He testified that he was at their apartment two to three times, and though he went into the one bedroom where they smoked meth, he never went into the second bedroom. He said that he didn't remember the door ever being open, and that he couldn't recall anyone going into that bedroom to check on a baby. The prosecutor then asked Clark how Harris interacted with Nala while he was there, and the same prosecutor asked the same question about Cohen at his trial. It appeared that both of the parents cared for Nala well. They were perfectly capable of caring for a child. On August 29th, Cohen went to work at about 5 p.m. and claims to have not seen Sterling at any point that day. How could he? The baby was in a swing, alone, in a bedroom with the door closed. Again, this is a reading of Cohen's testimony from Harris's trial. On August 29, 2017, did you have any interaction with Sterling? I'm sorry? Did you have any interaction with Sterling on August 29, 2017? No, I didn't. Why not? He was sleeping. Now, we talked about what time you went to work on the 29th. Uh-huh. Just to be clear, what time did you go to work on the 29th? Around 5, 5, 5.20. And what time did you get home on the 30th? On the 30th, about 3.34. After you got home on the morning of the 30th, what did you do? Oh, I played a game on my phone. It was bejeweled, and I made a little bit of food because my daughter woke up, and she was expressing to me that she was hungry, so I made a little something for her. Did you hear Sterling at all in the morning hours of August 30th? I did not. About what time did you go to bed? Around 6 a.m. What time roughly did you wake up? I was woken up at, I figured it was 11 or something, but that was from a different phone. It was around noon. How were you woken up? She came into the foot of the bed there, and I was sleeping, and she dropped to her knees and was crying hysterically and kept saying, he's gone, he's gone. When you say she, who is she? Cheyenne. And you said she was crying hysterically? Yes. How do you know that she was crying? I assumed it was crying. She couldn't, she couldn't speak for a while. She was... She was distraught, and yeah, I couldn't, I had to ask her quite a few, time, a few times questions so she would actually answer that I could understand. When she was crying and upset, did she tell you what happened? She had said, he's gone, he's gone, and then I asked, who's gone, and she's like, Sterling. What did, what happened after she said, Sterling's gone? I jumped out of bed and ran to the bedroom there and, and, and looked at him. And I noticed he wasn't moving, so I touched right here, and he was cold. And I looked at, and I seen some blood out of his mouth, or what looked to be blood. When you say you touched right here, for the record, you touched your forehead? Forehead, yes. He came home from work and eventually went to bed. He did not check on the baby before he went to bed. 
I know all people are different, but as a father, I can't imagine not poking my head into my children's bedroom while they're asleep just to check on them. To have no sense of interest in your own child seems very foreign to me. At about noon, Harris woke him up telling him that Sterling was gone. He went into the bedroom and touched the boy's forehead, which was cold. He saw some blood coming out of his mouth. Then he called 911, but that call didn't come in until about 12.55 p.m. At some point in the 30th, you called 911, correct? Yes. About how long after you woke up until you called 911? It took a little bit to call because in Alta Vista, there's absolutely no service for Verizon phones, which we have. So I was going back and forth through the apartment trying to get a signal. And then when I couldn't find one in there, I went outside and was holding my phone up trying to get a signal. Or her phone, I'm sorry. And then I finally got one after Ms. Shriver had spoke to me. And then I went back inside and made the call. Were you smoking outside? I was. And why were you outside again? Trying to search for a signal. Now he specifically says that Verizon doesn't have a signal in Alta Vista. But if you call 911 on a cell phone, FCC regulations require it to connect to any cell tower regardless of what provider owns it. Even if you don't have a plan for the phone, it is required by law to still connect to the closest tower to complete the call to 911. Now, if there was no cellular service of any kind, he might have had an issue, but that's never specified in either trial. He finally gets a signal and calls 911. Chickasaw County, 911. Yeah, just got here to my apartment. Okay, what's your address, Zach? 107 South Hilltop Avenue in Alta Vista. Okay, what's going on? Uh, around 9, my girlfriend went to uh, feed our son, and then uh, about 11 or, or 11.30, she went to check on him, and he was gone. Gone, meaning? He died. Okay. He's like, he like uh, probably four months. I don't know if it's sudden death syndrome or what. Okay. So you live at 107 South Hilltop in, eight, in Alta Vista? What? At, um, Apartment 7. Apartment 7? Okay. And your son is four months old, and the last time they, they, you was checked on was nine? No, it was, it was she was fed in at nine. Okay. And uh, she hadn't heard him. Uh, she had a check on her, and heard him cry or whatever, and it was probably about 11.30, 11.40. She uh, went to check on him. He, he passed away. Okay, so that's the last time they checked on him. Okay, what's your phone number there, Zach? Uh, 406 Okay. Um, I'll get them paged out, okay? I'll, I'm going to send the name of the and everybody up there, okay? okay All right, thanks. He calmly tells the operator that he needs an ambulance because his girlfriend checked on his son and he was gone. The operator clarifies because saying he's gone would normally mean that he's missing, and he says he died. He claims that she fed him at 9 o'clock that morning and he was fine, but when she went back in at 11.30, he had died. He suggested that he may have died of SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. Sudden Infant Death Syndrome is when a baby under the age of one year old dies and there's no explanation. Even after a crime scene investigation and autopsy are performed, if the death is still unexplained, it will be ruled as SIDS. If a baby dies unexpectedly and the cause of death is later explained, such as an infection or brain abnormality, the death is ruled to be SUDI, or Sudden Unexpected Death in Infancy. Sterling's death was not SIDS or SUDI because there was an obvious cause of death and the death wasn't unexpected. At least it shouldn't have been. If you leave an infant in a room for more than a week with no food or clean diaper, you should expect that they'll die. The 911 operator notified volunteer first responder Tony Frederick, who made it to the apartment within minutes. I pulled right up and uh, I saw a, a man, a woman, and a little girl 
And I got on my car and I went running up to them and said, where's the baby? Uh, I didn't, nobody was showing any emotion and, and the man goes inside and I said, show me. And so he took me inside, we walked in and we went to the, we went to the back bedroom. <clears throat> he took me to the back bedroom and it was dark and it was stuffy and there was a stench of urine there. I was looking for a crib, I couldn't see a crib. I said, where's the baby? And he said, in the swing. And, I, and it was dark, I said, we've got to get some lights on in here, turn the lights on. And he flipped the switch and the lights came on. And he, as he was, and he walked away and he muttered something and I don't know what he muttered. What did you see when the lights came on? Well, you could see the, the um, swing. It was facing an outside wall in the corner. And so then I um, went over so I could see Sterling, the baby that's found out that's what his name was. And <clears throat> to, to do my assessment, look, listen, and feel, um, his eyes were fixed and dilated, staring straight out. Um, uh, he had blood around his mouth. And... Uh, I went to check a brachial pulse on him and his arm was stiff and rigid and cold. All of his extremities were cold. His little feet were cold. His hands were clenched in a fist and he wasn't breathing and his, his clothes were like crusty. She says that when she arrived, Cohen, Harris, and Nala were standing outside, and it didn't seem like they had any emotion. According to Cohen's own testimony, Harris had been crying so hard she couldn't speak when she woke him up, but now she shows no emotion. She also described the lack of urgency with the parents, having to urge them to show her where the baby was. Once in the bedroom, she finds Sterling in the mechanical swing facing the corner. While researching this story, I always had this picture in my mind that you would open the door and see the baby in the swing facing you, but the swing was facing out, toward the walls. Obviously, the boy was past the point of performing CPR. When you saw Sterling, did you know that there was nothing you could do? Yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's no CPR. It, it's, you know... It just wasn't right. I want to take a moment to point out that the victim in these cases is not the only victim. This woman has worked in the medical field for 35 years, and this case will affect her for the rest of her life. There have been other cases where other first responders have quit their job over having to deal with an especially heinous case involving a child. When these monsters make the callous decision to abuse their child and cause their death, they're setting up a situation where dozens of people are going to come in and have to deal with their actions. Those other people will have to deal with the depression, the nightmares, and possibly years of counseling because they couldn't think outside of their own selfish behavior. I have nothing but respect and eternal thanks for the people who put themselves in these situations to help those who cannot help themselves. Sterling was transferred to the medical examiner's office, where Dr. Dennis Klein performed an autopsy on August 31st. During Dr. Klein's testimony at Harris's trial, he explains what a medical examiner is looking for and what cause of death and manner of death mean. I find this very helpful for anyone who's trying to understand an autopsy report. Now, when you do an autopsy, what types of questions are you trying to answer? 
There are a number of different questions. The two biggest questions that we were asked to answer is what is the cause of death and what is the manner of death? What does cause of death mean? So cause of death uh, is defined as the uh, disease, the injury, the abnormality or poisoning that initiates or starts a series of dysfunctions in the body that ultimately leads to death. So if I am uh, shot in the head, what would my cause of death be? It would be gunshot wound of head. What does manner of death mean? So manner of death is a category of death uh, where a medical examiner uh, uses their medical judgment, gathering information uh, about the decedent and placing them in one of five major categories. And those categories include natural, accident, suicide, homicide, and undetermined. Uh, and tell us what the differences between those are. So natural is when a person's uh, death is totally due to natural diseases. Uh, an accident is when uh, a death occurs in which there is some uh, event that happens within the environment, but there's no intent or purposeful action either by themselves or other people to result in their death. Uh, suicide is when uh, someone takes actions intentionally to cause their own death. Homicide is when another person uh, does uh, some action that results in another person's death, so they die at the hands of another person. And then undetermined is when there is not enough information in order to uh, determine with any degree of certainty one particular category over the other, and then it's left as undetermined. The medical examiner determined that the cause of death for Sterling was dehydration, malnutrition, and infection. He had such a severe diaper rash that it had caused open wounds on his skin where E. coli bacteria from the feces was able to enter his bloodstream. He determined that the manner of death was homicide. During the autopsy, Dr. Klein found that Sterling was sitting in a diaper that was filled with fecal matter where some had begun decaying. This told him that he had been sitting in that feces for an extended period of time. Describe for the jury what you saw. So um, there, were, there was clothing, there was a diaper, um, and within the diaper there was uh, uh, feces that um, had, had the appearance of beginning to decompose, uh, so it had almost a sludge or sewage uh, type of appearance and consistency. It had been there a while? Yes. On Section 3, you wrote maggot infestation of clothing and swing seat. Yes. Tell us about your findings on that. So maggots are uh, one of the uh, life stages of flies. Um, and uh, so flies will lay eggs uh, in uh, decomposing tissue. Um, and then those flies will develop into, they look like little crawling worms and they're called maggots. And then they'll go through other various stages. So we saw these crawling maggots present um, on the clothing, and then uh, Sterling was in a uh, swing seat. We also saw it in the covering on the swing seat. Did you also see it on his skin? Uh, yes. They also found maggots in the feces, in the clothing, in the swing, and on the body. Part of the autopsy was to determine that Sterling hadn't had any other condition that would cause him to not thrive like a normal, healthy baby. And as part of your, your autopsy, do you look for things like, could it be some type of disease? Could it be something he was born with that would have caused this? Yes, we do, uh, do go through a series of what in, we use in medicine we call a differential uh, diagnosis. So we come up with a list of things that we know that can cause people not to thrive. And so we do our best to try to rule out um, each of those uh, various diagnoses. Uh, so for instance, infections, uh, we look for what's called metabolic disorders. So these are things on the molecular level that can uh, prevent children from growing at a normal rate. We look at 
um, the intestines and the whole digestive tract. Uh, we look at it under the microscope. We look at it with our uh, anatomically to make sure that there's uh, no twists or things that can prevent children from growing uh, normally. And going through all those different tests and observations, uh, we were able to rule out um, the things in our differential diagnosis that would typically cause failure to thrive. The medical examiner determined that Sterling had no medical reason to not grow like any other healthy baby. The fact that he was born two weeks early did not play any part in his death either. Sterling died of dehydration, malnutrition, and due to an infection caused by extreme diaper rash. He sat in a dirty diaper for at least nine days until his skin became so raw that it became infected. Dr. Klein goes on to describe that even after a day, the smell of an unchanged diaper would be noticeable. After the feces started to decay, it would have become a very pungent odor. The baby would have cried constantly when it felt thirsty and hungry, and it wouldn't have been something you could just not notice. He also testified that it would not be possible that someone changed Sterling on the 29th, which was claimed by Cohen and Harris. Zachary Cohen and Cheyenne Harris were arrested on October 25, 2017. They were charged with first-degree murder and tried separately. Cohen went to trial first. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence in this case is going to show that little Sterling was placed in a swing in an unheated, stuffy, hot room in that apartment. That he was left in the same diaper for at least nine, maybe 14 days. He was left in that diaper full of stool, such that it attracted bugs, flies that laid their eggs in that diaper, which eggs hatched into maggots while Sterling was alive. And those maggots were in his clothes and in his diaper, feeding on the feces in his diaper. And he laid in that room in that diaper between 9 and 14 days. And the evidence will show that that stool in his diaper irritated his skin, such that it ruptured the skin and his bodily fluids came out. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence in this case is going to show that Sterling died of malnutrition. He was under 7 pounds at almost 40 months of age on the fifth percentile in the growing chart. He died of dehydration because he wasn't fed and he didn't get water or hydration through milk and because of his injuries. And ladies and gentlemen, he died of diaper rash. That's right, diaper rash. The evidence is going to show that that feces he sat in that diaper ate through his skin allowing E. coli bacteria that was in this diaper and in the stools to enter his bloodstream and cause an infection. Malnutrition, dehydration, infection caused by diaper rash. That's what caused this child's death. And ladies and gentlemen, the evidence will show that this defendant, the father of that child, is responsible for that death. Cohen's defense argued that he wasn't responsible for the death of Sterling because it was Harris that was the baby's primary caregiver. His attorney questioned him about his education, which was only at an 8th grade level. They asked him if he had ever taken a biology class, to which he answered no, like he was completely unaware of how to take care of a baby because of this. The defense also brought up the fact that he was raised in a Mennonite community, which can traditionally see the father out working while the mother does all of the child rearing. The prosecutor quickly shot down these theories. Now, Mr. Cohen, to be clear, you're not claiming that you're only going through the eighth grade, that you only going through the eighth grade didn't give you the skills to care for a baby, are you? No. Somebody who has an eighth grade education knows that a baby needs a diaper change, right? Yes. Needs to be fed a bottle, right? Yes. You don't have to take a biology class for that, do you? I guess not. Probably health class. Well, you knew that, right? Yeah, from observations from other people. 
You don't have to grow up with a TV or a radio in your house to know that, do you? Probably not. And to be clear, there's nothing about you growing up in a Mennonite community that explains the death of Sterling, does it? No. In fact, you grew up in a stable home, right? Yes. And you had parents that cared for you? That's correct. They provided you with clean clothes? Yes. Diapers when you needed them when you were an infant? That is correct. And they provided you a good example of how to be a father, didn't they? Yes. You're not claiming that you didn't know what it took to raise a child, did you? No. He asked Cohen to explain why Sterling was the only person in the home who was not well-fed and taken care of. Can you explain how it was that you were well-fed, Cheyenne was well-fed, and Nala was well-fed, and your son was dying of malnutrition in the back bedroom? I cannot explain that, no. You have no explanation? I put my trust in the wrong person. And that's what you did wrong? I believe so, yes. He blames Harris multiple times during his testimony by saying, quote, I trusted the wrong person, end quote. The prosecutor then points out that even the dog was taken care of better than Sterling. Let's talk about the dog for a second. Your dog was named Leo, right? Yes. Prior to 911 coming, you took Leo out of the house, didn't you? I did. Did you do that before or after you called 911? It was after. And your focus was on getting Leo out of your house? Yes, because he was quite unfriendly. And was Leo supposed to be in your house? No. Now, Leo is a dog, right? Yes. Did you care for Leo? I did. A dog has to be fed, right? Yes. Can't feed itself? Nope. A dog has to get water, right? Yep. Can't get water for itself? Nope, he cannot. Did you give that dog food? Yes. Did you give that dog water? I did. I assume you didn't want that dog using your apartment as a bathroom, right? Correct. You took the dog outside? Yes. Would you agree that you took better care of Leo than you did your own son? The way it looks, yes. How would you explain that? I put my trust in the wrong person. But you didn't trust her to take care of the dog? Not all the time, no. How would you explain that Nala was well taken care of? I don't know. Is it because you knew Nala was your child? No. Is it because you didn't think Sterling was your child? No, that didn't have no matter to me. He again blames putting trust in the wrong person. He trusted her enough to take care of Sterling, but not enough to take care of Leo. If he didn't know that his baby was malnutritioned and sitting in a loaded diaper full of decomposing feces, it's because he just didn't care about him. Giving Cohen the benefit of the doubt, at the very least, he is guilty of having no interest in his infant son. Zachary Cohen was found guilty of first-degree murder on November 6, 2018, and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Cheyenne Harris's trial was a few months later, and the prosecutor had a very similar opening statement. Her defense attorney's opening statement was just over one minute long. There's no doubt that this case is it's a terrible case. It's a tragedy. You're going to wonder what kind of monster to do something like this. The monster in this case is mental health. The monster in this case is depression, postpartum, substance abuse. You're gonna hear evidence in this case about Ms. Harris, what she was going through, how she suffered from depression, how she suffered from postpartum, and how she self-medicated. You're not gonna hear in this case about the typical type of actions you might hear when you hear about child abuse. You're not going to hear about injuries. You're not going to hear about broken bones. You're not going to hear about bruises. You're not going to hear about any purpose on Ms. Harris's part to harm Sterling. You're not going to hear about any evil design or any plan or any ill will towards Sterling. You're not going to hear any evidence that she's evil. That's because she's not evil, and this, is, this case is not murder. Thank you. Quote, the monster in this case is mental health, end quote. The defense goes on to explain that Harris suffered from depression, postpartum, and substance abuse. Now, those are real problems that any mother can experience, but they aren't a valid reason for leaving a four-month-old in the same diaper with no food for over a week. On top of that, those mental health issues didn't keep her from taking care of her two-year-old daughter, Nala. Honestly, if you're going to cause the death of a child, whether it's by physical abuse, neglect, 
or looking the other way while somebody else abuses them, it's safe to say that you suffer from some type of mental illness. That's not a reason that you shouldn't be held responsible for the death of that child. The defense goes on to explain that there were no injuries, broken bones, or bruises on Sterling. She did not have any evil plan or ill will toward the baby. I beg to differ. Starving a baby to death seems like ill will. Allowing an infant to sit in a dirty diaper, in its own urine and feces, for at least nine days until it dies from severe diaper rash, seems like ill will. They're asserting that because she didn't actively strike the baby to cause harm, she wasn't guilty when you can just as easily harm an infant through inaction. The defense says that you would not hear any evidence of purpose on Harris's part, and that's true. There was absolutely no reason why that baby was not taken care of by either parent. They put him in a swing, facing a wall in a dark room, with the door closed and left him to die. On February 6, 2019, Cheyenne Harris was found guilty of first-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. If you like this show, please subscribe or leave me a rating on whatever podcast app you use. On YouTube, you can subscribe, hit like, or leave me a comment. If you'd like to support the show, you can donate a few dollars through Buy Me A Coffee. You can click the link on our website or YouTube channel, or go to buymeacoffee.com backslash monsters. If you shop on Amazon, you can go to our website and click on the Amazon banner, where you can purchase items at no additional charge, but will get a small commission. I'm always trying to increase my content and improve its quality, and your support will help me do that. Thank you in advance.